So I, I want to tell you a, a story that has wrecked my career and uh, <laughs> made me a hero to some and a nightmare to others. And it was really quite unexpected to me uh, to get involved in this uh, crazy field. Um, and it's uh, still, uh, well, at least it's a very good example of science in progress uh, uh, with all warts and all. Uh, so uh, most of my colleagues will tell you that the universe is filled with some invisible mass that we generically call dark matter. Um, it is nothing like the stuff we know. Uh, and I've come to suspect that maybe that's just a, a figment of our Newtonian imaginations and that, in fact, we need to change an even more uh, fundamental law, uh, something to do with the law of gravity. Uh, and this illustration is now 20 years old. Uh, this is something I sketched while still a postdoc that illustrates the, the, the roots of the problem, the various lines of evidence that lead to discrepancies between what you see and what you get. The, that is, uh, there are different kinds of systems, as I'll go into more detail, uh, that if you use the laws of gravity as we know them, apply them to the stuff you see, you do not get the right answer. And that leads you to infer that there's more matter there than meets the eye, or maybe we assume the wrong uh, law in the first place. And there are all sorts of ideas for what the right answer should be, uh, and this uh, has been such a compelling idea in physics that uh, it's actually the cover issue of a physics teacher a couple of years ago, which is kind of fun. And of course, nowadays you can't help people have to Photoshop in pretty stars and backgrounds and things. <laughs> now, the philosophical quip I like to start with uh, comes from Mark Twain, though I've also heard it attributed to Yogi Berra, who at some point said everything. Um, <laughs> But it, the, what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. And uh, a lot of my colleagues, and me too, I was uh, certainly in this uh, camp that believed in dark matter. We were absolutely sure that the universe had to be pervaded by this invisible substance. And that may still be right, but it may not be. Uh, and part of the problem we face now is that a, a lot of us are acting like we know this for sure. Uh, Maybe so. So a quick review of some of the things we know for sure. Uh, Isaac Newton uh, gave us the Poisson equation. Well, why is it not, that not called the Newton equation? It takes a while to sort these things out. It's a lot of math that goes into this. Um, and, but basically, this boils down to Newton's famous inverse square law uh, of gravity, uh, which he himself, it took, uh, as near as I can tell reading the histories, it took him about 20 years before he realized that there was a good geometric reason for the inverse square law. Nowadays, we expect our students to get that right away. It's trivially obvious. That's great if you know it already, right? <laughs> um, but one of uh, the greatest geniuses in our history, it took him a while to sort that out. Um, and at the time, it was such a, uh, a strange idea that you could have action at a distance. That this was considered almost magical thinking, right? Really. If you were going to exert a force on an object, you had to physically push it. Right? You had to be in contact with it. Uh, and so action at a distance was literally considered magical thinking, not scientific. And he was criticized roundly for this by people like Leibniz. Uh, now it's a very natural part of physics. Uh, OK, so we know these things for sure. Therefore, the universe is filled with non-baryonic cold dark matter. Uh, OK, there are a few steps in between. How did we get to this conclusion? OK, so this is the dark matter tree again here. Uh, the roots of the problem down here, the various hypothesized solutions. Um, and really, what you have is a discrepancy. You apply Newton's laws to galaxies, clusters of galaxies. The universe as a whole doesn't work out. So either there's more mass that you see. That could be normal stuff. It could be some entirely new stuff, maybe neutrinos, something else you make up. Uh, or you have to change the rules. Both of those things are really radical things to consider. Um, we've gotten very familiar with this one, and so it's not considered radical anymore. But it is new physics. It is not part of the physics that we know. Uh, and what I think we, uh, uh, the scientific community, can all agree on is that the physics we know for sure, Einstein's general relativity, gravity, which contains Newton, 
Uh, and the standard model of particle physics that describes all the protons, neutrons, electrons, things like that. Those things together do not suffice to explain our universe. You've got to break one, maybe both. And so the whole issue here that I want to talk about is which one uh, are we going to break? Uh, so let me go over the evidence that leads us to such a radical assertion. Um, one very important line of evidence is the rotation curves of spiral galaxies. Uh, so, nice pretty spiral galaxy here. You can spectroscopically measure uh, through the Doppler shift the speeds of uh, stars and gas as it rotates around in that galaxy. Uh, and if you then plot the velocity uh, of things as a function of radius from the center, then speeds go up and they more or less flatten out. And they do not come back down. Now that's what Newton predicted. If you go back and work out what should be going on here, once you've encompassed most of this mass, you should see a, a 1 over square root of r fall off. So things should sort of go like that. You don't observe that. It stays high. That rotation curve is approximately flat. This was, of course, discovered by uh, Vera Rubin, who was one of my postdoctoral mentors, um, and also Albert Bosma in uh, Europe in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and at the time, Vera would tell me the story that nobody wanted to believe it. And, you know, famous astronomers would tell her things like, well, that's just an effect of looking at a bright galaxy. And you go away and scratch your head and say, well, what the heck does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. It was a stupid thing to say, right? But it's just such a crazy result that it's the sort of thing you're forced to. So the fact that that stays flat tells you something else is going on. Either you need more mass. Uh, or you need to change the rules. Clusters of galaxies are the same way. This is a rich cluster of galaxy. All these little yellow fuzzy things are entire galaxies of stars, comparable, uh, many of them brighter than the Milky Way, uh, all cohabiting a relatively small uh, space. It's sort of the central megaparsec uh, of this uh, system. And clusters of galaxies exhibit a discrepancy in several ways. Uh, this particular example is dramatic for having all these arcs. These are background galaxies that have uh, been gravitationally lensed by the mass in the cluster, and so they're distorted. And you can work out how much mass needs to be here uh, in order to cause that distortion. And again, you need a lot more than meets the eye. Just the stars that you can see there are not nearly enough mass to do the gravitational bending that you see. You can also measure the velocities of the individual galaxies, and you find they're whizzing around relative to each other, such that, again, if the only mass that was there uh, was what you see, this whole thing would fly apart on a short time scale. So you need something more to hold it together. Either you need some invisible form of mass, or you need to make the law of gravity stronger. Uh, and there's also, in these kinds of systems, a hot intracluster medium, a very thin, uh, but massive component of X-ray emitting uh, hot gas that fills the space between the galaxies. Uh, it turns out it weighs more than the stars uh, in the galaxies. But again, you can figure out uh, how much gravity you need to hold all that hot gas in, which would otherwise easily evaporate. And each of those three things independently tells you that what you see is not what you get. Uh, on the largest scales, uh, we need something to make structure grow. So this is uh, just a map of the sky, the entire sky, and each dot represents an entire galaxy like the Milky Way. Okay. So we're talking very large scales now, and the eye can trace out these filaments that surround these empty voids. Uh, the Milky Way itself here is this gray band that's the zone of avoidance where dust in the Milky Way uh, obscures our view of galaxies outside of it. Uh, but we've mapped out the rest of the sky pretty well, and you see these extremely large structures. Now, gravity will do that. We know from the uh, observations of the cosmic microwave background that the initial condition of the universe is very homogeneous, very smooth. This chunk was very much like that chunk, like that other chunk, which looks nothing like this now, where you have these bright galaxies with huge empty space in between. Gravity will take little bitty uh, density perturbations, places that are just a little more dense than the surrounding space, and it'll make the rich get richer. Those little bitty enhancements in density will attract more mass 
and it will attract more mass, and it gets uh, bigger and bigger, and eventually becomes the galaxies that you see here. Uh, so gravity very naturally makes this structure out of something initially smooth. But it can't do it in the amount of time that we have in the universe. Ancient as the universe is, about 14 billion years old, uh, you can't get there, you can't get here from there in that amount of time, because gravity is a very weak force. So you have to do something to goose the process, like add in more mass, or change the law of gravity. Okay, so uh, assuming for the moment that it is in fact dark matter, as uh, I believe to begin with, uh, and as most of my colleagues still do, uh, what is it? What could be this invisible stuff that's holding uh, uh, the universe together? Uh, so one thing, baryonic dark matter, baryonic is this unfortunate technical term that uh, the physicists have taught us, uh, just refers to normal mass, stuff made of neutrons and protons. So whenever I lapse into saying baryonic, that's what I mean. It's normal stuff, uh, and I say that to distinguish it from whatever the dark matter is, which it's not. Now, you could make the dark matter out of normal stuff. There's nothing that says that uh, the normal matter has to shine like stars. And so there were plenty of ideas for what uh, you could make uh, dark matter of, just normal stuff, uh, very faint stars, brown dwarfs, uh, Jupiter-sized planets, very small rocks. Um, most of those don't really work. And in fact, there's a Nobel Prize waiting for whoever discovers the dark matter, so people have looked very hard for those things, and they've basically all been excluded. If you, make, if you try to make dark matter out of ordinary stuff, even if, you, if it doesn't glow directly, usually you can figure out some indirect way. It interacts with photons. You'll find some way of figuring out whether it's there or not. And there's really, there are a few very obscure sounding candidates that aren't completely excluded, but at this point, it's pretty clear it's not normal stuff. Uh, another idea uh, is called hot dark matter. Uh, hot in this context means dynamically fast. Uh, individual particles are moving around really, really fast. And in fact, hot in this case means relativistic. These things are moving close to the speed of light. Now, when neutrinos were first uh, identified, it was thought that they only carried energy and no rest mass at all, so that they did move at the speed of light. Uh, and in fact, when I first heard this suggested as well, if you give them a little bit of mass and then they could be the dark matter, I just thought, well, that's crazy because that would mess up particle physics. They can't have mass. Well, uh, it turns out that that part of particle physics was wrong. And one of the great discoveries in the past decade or so is that neutrinos do, in fact, have some rest mass. But it's a tiny number. It's not enough to do this. Um, and so there's, there's just not enough mass in the neutrinos uh, to do this. And in fact, if they have too much mass, they'll wash out that large-scale structure because rather than forming uh, individual objects, they just are moving so fast, they'll just run right through it. Uh, so that leaves us making up something entirely new. Uh, and this is generically referred to as cold dark matter. Cold here means slow-moving particles, non-relativistic, moving at a mere couple hundred kilometers a second in our own galaxy. Um, and we have no idea what it is, really. It has to be some entirely new fundamental particle that is not part of the standard model of particle physics. It's not a neutron, a proton, or anything related to that. It has to be something fundamentally different. Um, it has, by construction, to not interact with light. Protons, electrons do that, right? Um, so we make up a particle that does not uh, experience the uh, electromagnetic interaction, that's good. It can be very dark. Um, one notion is that it might interact through the weak nuclear force, and we'll come back to that. But as astronomers, there are really two big motivations for uh, going along with this idea that comes out of the particle physics community. Uh, one is that we really want more mass to be out there in the universe than is allowed by Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which puts a pretty strong constraint on uh, the amount of normal matter as I'll explain in a moment, and also this need to grow cosmic structure. So that is the odds-on favorite that everybody has right now, and that, I shared that opinion. This is the line of logic that led us to this conclusion, and it makes perfect sense. Uh, 
so one thing you can do is go out and measure the amount of baryons. This is the density of normal matter relative to the cosmic critical value. This is sort of the one obvious magic number, obvious scale in cosmology. The over-under point where if you have more mass than this, the universe will eventually stop its expansion and recollapse. And below that, uh, it won't. Uh, it'll just expand forever. And so it's been known for a long time, if you want to explain the abundance of the light elements, which are made in the first three minutes when the entire universe is one big nuclear furnace, uh, you get out of that the right amount of helium, the right amount of lithium, right amount of deuterium, if the density of baryons is this tiny amount, somewhere way down here of order 5%, nowhere near this magic closure value. But you can also go out and measure how much gravity there seems to be how much mass is making things move around, and you get a very different answer. Instead of about 5%, you get something more like 25%. Okay. And this number, the stuff that you infer gravitationally, is much bigger than this number. So you need mass out there, but you need there to be a lot more of it than you actually are allowed in normal matter. So you need something else, some new fundamental particle. Uh, that's this cold dark matter. Now, that's a good line of uh, argument by itself. I don't think that would have convinced everyone. Independently, you also have to make the uh, structure grow, as I alluded to before. So the initial condition of the universe is mapped out by the cosmic microwave background. That is essentially a snapshot of the universe when it was only uh, a few hundred thousand years old. And we've turned up the contrast on this image so you can see the density contrasts, the uh, hotter and colder spots in here. But really, the, the real story of that is that the temperature of the universe at that time is incredibly uniform uh, to one part in 100,000. Okay, so it, it is just incredibly smooth. And like I said, gravity will take those little differences and grow them, but it'll do it painfully slowly. So to go from a really smooth initial condition to a universe full of galaxies with lots and lots of empty space between them uh, is a tall order. And you can't do it just with gravity and the stuff you see. You need something else to goose the process. And a form of dark matter that doesn't interact with light does the trick. If it interacted with light, we'd see evidence for it in this. So you, again, need some form of mass that is different from the stuff we know about already. Uh, so the cold dark matter is uh, generically what we need. Astronomers just care that it moves slowly uh, and so that you can form structures and that it does not interact with light so that it doesn't mess up nucleosynthesis or uh, leave a feature there. Uh, particle physicists have a number of ideas. The, by far the most popular uh, hypothesis is a particle called the WIMP, uh, which stands for the Weakly Interacting Massive Particle. Neutrino is a weakly interacting particle. It does not interact with the electromagnetic force, but it does interact with the weak nuclear force. But it is not massive. It has a very low mass. So we're thinking now of something that's uh, weakly interacting, like a neutrino, um, but much more massive, heavy like an atomic nucleus. We've just made this up. It fits the bill. Uh, and you can uh, write down very convincing theories that contain such objects, but they are outside of the standard model of particle physics. They are new physics, so they are radical in that sense. But we are pushed to this extreme, uh, and now it's become mainstream. It's very standard to talk about this. Uh, we are sure, we don't know it for sure, but we act as if we do, that the universe is mostly made of this cold dark matter, presumably a wimp, though you could come up with other candidates. Uh, and so this is pie chart sort of represents the, the content, the mass energy content of the universe. Um, dark matter, this cold dark matter is maybe a quarter. Uh, the normal stuff is just 5%. That's the baryons that you get from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And the rest, the other 70% or so, is uh, dark energy, which I'm not even going to go into. But that's the stuff that makes the expansion rate of the universe accelerate. It acts like anti-gravity. It pushes rather than pulls. Now, if folks had come out and said, oh, we've discovered anti-gravity, 
Yeah, right. Yeah, just go visit the local psychiatric help, please. Uh, but if you call it dark energy, then you get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and there is some, some branding issue there. But um, of this entire pie chart, this is inferred. The dark matter is inferred from the sort of a gravitational uh, motions by assuming that gravity is right. If you make that assumption, then you are forced to infer that this dark matter exists. Same thing when you look at the expansion history of the universe. That cannot happen in Einstein's theory unless you put in an anti-gravity term, which is not there normally. So we infer this to exist because we assume that Einstein is right, 100 percent, and there's nothing else uh, to learn about gravity. Uh, and even about the normal matter, you can go out and make a census of this. This is the sort of thing we astronomers do. We go out and count stars and add them up. Um, and we get maybe 70 percent. 30 percent are still missing. Right? So even of this wedge of normal stuff, we don't get a full accounting of the stuff that we think is out there. So if you add it up, there's really only about 3.5 percent of the total mass energy budget of the universe that we can honestly swear that, yeah, we've seen that. That makes me a little uncomfortable, right? Many of my colleagues will tell you and swear on a sack of Bibles, this is the right answer. This is holy writ. We know this. Well, no, we, we know 3.5% of it, and we infer the rest of it by assuming that gravity is normal. Once you make that assumption, you're driven here. But is that a good assumption? Well, People have been looking for this dark matter because there is a Nobel Prize, for sure, waiting for whoever discovers it. And by far the leading candidate are these weakly interacting massive particles. And so you can build a detector that is targeted to detect, to interact with weakly inter interacting particles. You have to make them really big because the weak interaction is weak, so it happens very rarely. So this axis tells you something about the interaction probability. If you actually read the numbers, they're tiny, 10 to the minus 44, 10 to the minus 45. The, the chance of one of these wimps actually interacting with a normal piece of matter in your detector is very small. If you made a big enough detector and you're patient enough, maybe that'll happen. And people have made fantastic advances in the technology to do this. It's really amazing what people are doing, because you have to uh, build a big detector. You have to take it down to the bottom of a mine shaft where it's shielded from cosmic rays. It will also set it off. Uh, you have to completely clean the material that you're using of all radioactive, naturally occurring radioactive substances, because that will also set it off. You have to refrigerate it to almost next to absolute zero, because any thermal motion will also set it off. Right? You have to exclude all of these normal things before you can claim to detect dark matter. And it's just fabulous, the, the things that people have accomplished doing that. So usually what they, uh, the result of these experiments is a plot of the interaction uh, probability, or the cross-section as they call it, as a function of the mass of the particle. Uh, and the original prediction for what one of these WIMPs should be like is up there. By, uh, what, seven years ago now, we had excluded all the regions above that red line. That original prediction was basically dead. But theorists are not to be, Majorana, did we say 10 to the minus 30? No, we meant 10 to the minus 44. So they moved the goalposts. So the new prediction was down here as of 2008. And uh, we had a meeting at Case, uh, was it that year, 2009, where some of my colleagues and myself were like, mm, you know, where's the probability at? Because there's this tail here. And they're like, no, no, about 98 percent of the probability is up here. It's, it's not going to be down there. I'm like, mm, you know, those low probability tails look a lot more probable when you rule out the head. Well, so these things have progressed. Uh, this is the same kind of plot. The scales change. Um, by 2011, We've now excluded this region uh, above this blue line. And so notice the head from the previous plot is gone. That was where they said 98% of the probability density line. This is the tail. And that just sort of disappeared off of the newer plots because it's excluded. And so uh, by 2011, basically all of this region was gone. Don't even mention that the original prediction was up here somewhere. There are actually a few other claims to have actually detected something. Those do not uh, stand up to the better experiments. 
And so now we're starting to eat into the new most favored region, which is already the third set of goalposts. I'm currently sitting on uh, the thesis committee of a student at uh, Case, big group there working on this. Um, and they don't even bother plotting the predictions anymore, but roughly speaking, that's where it was in 2008. Here's the tail. And now they've excluded all of this region. Okay. So the question that, that uh, Chris Mijos, my colleague at Case Western, an astronomer, posed to the particle physicists uh, back in 2009 was, well, how low can you go? Right? You keep moving the goalposts on us. Uh, and they're like, well, why would you even ask us that? Um, and basically, after some back and forth, the answer was infinity. There's no reason that the dark matter has to actually be a WIMP that interacts weakly. Maybe it has no cross-section. Maybe it's just a particle that only interacts gravitationally. That is a logical possibility. It is also not experimentally testable. So that raises the question or whether or not it actually qualifies as science. It's not a falsifiable idea, which I find very disturbing. Now, I don't, well, I do some work on cosmology, but mostly I work on individual galaxies, uh, like this pretty spiral galaxy here that I took a picture of with the big 2.1 meter. I was actually there to study much fainter galaxies, but there was a layer of uh, haze at the time, cirrus, so not photometric. So we took pretty pictures. Um, but it, this reminded me of a quote which I've paraphrased from Tolkien, actually, in his creation myth, if you read the Silmarillion. A single galaxy might seem a little thing to those who consider only the immeasurable vastness of the universe, and not the minute precision to which all things therein are shaped. Uh, and I say this because many of my colleagues in cosmology think of galaxies as little things. They're small, they're weird, they're in a nonlinear regime. We don't know what they care, do, and we don't care. They don't tell us anything. The big picture is the large scale structure. And we do explain that well with this cold dark matter. Okay. But there is an incredible amount of detail, the minute precision, that goes into the shaping of these galaxies, which uh, was a surprise to me and is not understood in the terms of dark matter. So here's the rotation curve of that same uh, pretty galaxy. Um, velocity is a function of radius from the center. What Vera Rubin, of course, noticed long ago is that all these galaxies tend to have a sort of a flat rotation curve. Now, you can take uh, the Poisson equation that comes out of Newton's universal law of gravity. You can uh, apply it to this observed mass distribution, just what you see in the stars and the gas, solve the equation numerically, and predict what the rotation curve should be. And that's what that line is. That is what Newton says this distribution of mass that you see with your eyes should give you for uh, this galaxy. And of course, that's not what we observe. So the difference between what's predicted and what's observed, we fill in with dark matter. That's the origin of the inference of the existence of dark matter, is that this line doesn't go through this data. You need something else. And this is generically true. It's not just a one-off. Galaxies, whenever you observe them far enough out, have this basically flat kind of rotation curve. Now, when I came along, these bright things were all well-known and established. And what I've done is worked on these uh, fainter dwarf galaxies uh, going down to very low masses at this point. And they all fall this uh, particular relation. So if you measure that V-flat, that level at which this goes out. This is a big galaxy. It rotates at about 300 kilometers a second, kind of fast. Um, and you go down to these little dwarf galaxies, there's much less mass, not as many stars there. Um, and they rotate much slower, 20, 30 kilometers a second, like that. Okay. And uh, this tully fisher relation, which has been used a lot in the distance scale work, we don't actually understand why it works. It's basically, if you look at the sum of stars and gas, I, how much stuff you see, uh, that correlates very well with the amplitude of that flat rotation. So the big galaxies rotate fast, the small galaxies rotate slow. Well, well that makes sense, right? Well, but let's think about it a little. 
as well as different mass galaxies, you also have different density galaxies, um, high surface brightness galaxies, low surface brightness galaxies. Uh, so I've been working on these because, again, when I came along, these were well studied, so you get stuck with these dumpy little things. Okay. Um, and you zoom in on there, and you can see why these were not well studied. They're really hard to find. This is just the plate material that was uh, available to us in the early 90s. Um, you can go out and take a better image, and then you see this thing is about the same size as that. Okay. Um, it's not a difference in physical size. In fact, I chose this pair because they're about the same distance away. So the linear scale is comparable. What's different is the surface density of stars. The stars are just spread more thin in this low surface brightness galaxy. And I've had to crank up the gain here. You can see the noise from the CCD image is much larger than here. That's because I've cranked up the gain so you can see it at all. This is actually a higher signal to noise image than that one. Just don't have to work as hard to see that. OK, well, so I was working on these low surface brightness things. And I knew about the Tully fisher relation. And I knew about Newton. And Newton makes a very simple pre prediction. Uh, v squared goes as gm over r for his inverse squared law. So if you take a galaxy of the same mass but a different radius, i.e. these low surface brightness galaxies are more spread out, so they have a lower, uh, they, they, for the same mass they have a larger radius, so you would predict, I predicted, that they would have a lower rotation velocity. It's just what Newton says. Uh, so let's see what happens. This is the highest surface brightness bin that was known when I started doing this. You go to another surface brightness bin and you predict that you should see a systematic shift. That is, for every bin of surface brightness, and I'm going to do this in different magnitudes of surface brightness, you should get a systematic shift that you can calculate the amount of. Okay, so that green line is what you calculate. The green dots are what you observe for that next bin of surface brightness. You go to still lower surface brightness, there's more of a shift. The data didn't get the memo. Uh, and you keep going down to the lowest surface brightness things that we had observed when I made this plot. And by then, this is really a big effect. You should see this no problem. And you don't. There's no shift. Uh, and so this really made me scratch my head, and I didn't understand this. This effect had to be here, and there are all sorts of games you can play with how you distribute the dark matter plus the stars and so forth. The bottom line is you always end up with a seesaw. You have to finely tune how much of this and that. So basically, as you stretch out the baryons, you have to backfill with dark matter in order to always line up right exactly in the same place. That is what scientists call a fine-tuning problem. We don't like fine-tuning problems because it's good. they don't really, they're not stable. It just shouldn't work. It gets worse. So if you look at a, a pair of galaxies that share the same point, so every point on that diagram was one galaxy, you can find galaxies that lie exactly on the same place in that diagram, and here's an example of such a pair. One is high surface brightness, one is low surface brightness, so much larger radius, but the same total mass of stars and gas, the stuff you can see. So they have the same total mass, the same flat rotation, but the shape of the rotation curve is different if you plot it in physical units. Well, OK, so what? Well, you can rescale that. There are ways of characterizing the scale length of this disk. And you can renormalize this by the characteristic scale length of this disk. And when you do that, the rotation curves become indistinguishable. So physical units, you can see the difference. Uh, scaled to the light, they're right on top of each other. Well, so what, right? The dynamics cares about mass. And the mass we infer to be dark matter, not the stars. So why should it care about the scale length of the light? It shouldn't. It really should not care. The dark matter is calling the shots. And yet, you measure some one simple parameter about the light, and you completely uh, normalize this thing. We don't understand why that happens, but it's well observed at this point. So, this is a problem that's been around now for 20 years, and uh, there really is no satisfactory explanation for it. And if you ask people who are convinced that dark matter is right, and they have good reasons for thinking that, 
but the danger that we get into is that we know for sure that it's right, and therefore these things are just little puzzles and we'll work it out, and we certainly don't have to think hard about it. Well, so this is one of my favorite Calvin and Hobbes. You know, it's, gravity is arbitrary. Um, and I was uh, still a postdoc when I uh, happened, quite by chance, to hear a talk by Mahdi Milgram, who is an Israeli physicist, who back when flat rotation curves were newly discovered, uh, came up with this alternative idea. He said, well, instead of invoking dark matter, which we just infer because we're assuming Newton is right on scales very different from where we've tested it, let's tweak Newton, change the force law a little bit. And what he posited it was that there was a scale. Uh, an acceleration scale, and if accelerations were high, uh, everything is moving fast, like inside the solar system, everything happens like Newton predicts. But if the accelerations are very, very low, then you tweak Newton a little bit, and you do it in such a way to give you flat rotation curves. You effectively make gravity stronger. Um, and I, when I heard that, I was just like, oh yeah, right, that's silly. But I was having a problem understanding the, the dynamics that I just described, so I thought I should at least look up his work. And lo and behold, in his original series of papers on the topic, he had a line that said, this galaxies with low surface brightness provide particularly strong tests. And the reason for that is when you go into low surface brightness, you're talking about low surface density, and that means low acceleration in the context of this theory. So it's way into the regime that he's predicting a new phenomenon. Okay. And I, I, I literally, when I read this, I thought, great, I've been working on these things. I now have the data that has proved this stupid theory. Because uh, none of the data I'm about to show you existed in 1983 when he wrote this down. OK, so what did he actually predict in that thing? Well, he made a number of specific predictions about this tully fisher relation. One was that it had a particular slope uh, in log-log space, uh, and that measured slope is about 4. Okay. It has a particular normalization that just depends on this new constant of nature that he's made up. Uh, well, that actually works out, too. Uh, fundamentally, it's just a relation between what you see and what you get. right? In the dark matter picture, the flat velocity is caused by dark matter. But there's nothing about dark matter in this plot. You're plotting what you see against how fast it rotates. Okay. That's what he said should happen. And what really got my attention is that he explicitly predicted that there would be no dependence on surface brightness. Because when he tweaked Newton's law, that dependency on R that I was just making a big fuss about goes away. OK, I guess I can't say he's wrong based on that. Let's keep going. Uh, next thing he said, that if you just compute the conventional m to l, you assume Newton is right and can plot the, the enclosed mass to the enclosed luminosity, then that's going to depend on uh, both radius but also on surface brightness. So in the bright galaxies, as you go further out, you need more and more dark matter, so you see this m to l going up. But as you go to lower surface brightnesses, you're further into this modified regime that he's positing, so the apparent discrepancy will be larger, and it'll set in sooner. And so as you go to lower and lower surface brightness galaxies, that's exactly what you see. The discrepancy already appears. If, if these numbers are about 1, you don't need dark matter. Um, and this discrepancy is already quite noticeable at small radii in these low surface brightness galaxies. Whereas that's not really true in the bright ones. So, yeah. Uh, he's made a specific prediction for the shapes of rotation curves that the bright galaxies would go up and flatten out very quickly or even fall a little bit uh, before they uh, flattened out. But as you go to lower surface brightness things, they should rise gradually and only slowly turn over. And again, that's what we saw. Now, in this uh, uh, theory, there is no dark matter. So what you see better be what you get. The surface density of mass should correlate with the surface brightness caused by the stars. That's what this shows. He suggested a, a way of measuring the dynamical mass. This is what I measured for the surface brightness. And there's a correlation there. That line is just 
what he predicted. It's not a fit. And the scatter is presumably due to the fact that stars have different mass to light ratios by a little bit from galaxy to galaxy. Okay. Now finally, there should be, uh, this is a force law, and once you write down the force law, you're stuck with it. What you see is what you get. So uh, what his formula does is give you a way of mapping from what Newton predicts to what you see. So really, Newton predicts these blue lines, and Mon just gives you a formula to amplify things up to explain the, the whole rotation curve. Well, you are stuck with this shape that Newton predicted in the first place for what you see for the stars. You don't get to play with the shape. You get to play with the mass to light ratio of the stars and scale that up a little down, but up and down a little bit, but you, you, you cannot affect the shape. So every time you observe a different galaxy, it should have a rotation curve whose shape and amplitude follows uniquely from the observed distribution of stars and gas. And so we've done this a lot of times. It's a black point sort of data. The dashed lines represent uh, the observed distribution of stars and gas as what Newton would predict. And then the monfit is in black, that solid line that goes through there. And so you can do that over and over and over again. Okay. Um, and usually the fits are pretty good. They are not always perfect. Right? There are some discrepancies here, but they're not huge. In general, you get good fits, and there's a way of quantifying that. It's called the residual diagram. So this is uh, the residual of all the fits of this uh, theory of Milgram's to all the rotation curves that I could put my hands on. So 78 distinct galaxy with over 2,000 resolved individual points there. And yeah, there are some messy points. Didn't fit well there. But I would suggest this is the forest, and these are a few outlying trees. Okay, and this is basically as good as it gets in astronomy. There's always some goofy points for some reason or another. Uh, so it fits the data. Um, and each individual galaxy is its own test because each galaxy is unique. Uh, and the rotation curve has to be different in the way stipulated by the observed distribution of stars. Now there is one extra uh, test here because you do get to play with the mass to light ratio. The shape is fixed, but what we observe is light. What physics needs to know is mass, and so you have to assume a mass to light ratio for the stars. Now we know enough about stars at this point that we can get a pretty good a priori guess for what it should be. The sun is a typical star, so we'd expect the typical mass to light ratio to be around one solar mass per solar luminosity. But it doesn't have to be exactly that. Um, so we can let that be a free parameter and then compare the results to what we expect for what we know about stars. So this is the mass to light ratio from Mon Fitz in the blue filter band, this in the near infrared band, uh, and these lines are what's predicted by stellar population models is what we know about stars. Those things have nothing to do with each other, and I'm sure my colleagues who made those models would be horrified to know I'm using them in this way. <laughs> uh, and in fact, on top of that, you expect a different amount of scatter. There should be less scatter in the near-infrared than there is in the optical. So not only do you fit the data, but the one fit parameter that you have returns something that makes sense in terms of what you know about stars. Completely different astrophysical property and constraint. So not only do you get the fits, the fits make sense in terms of what we know about populations. So, clearly he's wrong, right? This is what I expected to come to as a conclusion. I, it was a very a great struggle for me to admit that, no, not only is he not wrong, but there appears to be something to this. Now, <laughs> I was very angry when I found this. I really spent many sleepless nights staring at the ceiling. How could this stupid theory have any predictions come true when there's so much evidence for dark matter? Now, when I go and tell the same story to my colleagues, this is the reaction they have, <laughs> which is the same reaction I had. I understand it because we grew up with this stuff and it made so much sense. And it's, there are other things that I'm not talking about, I don't have time to talk, where it does make sense, but it doesn't make any sense in galaxies. Um, so one of the places where um, 
dark matter does make sense is back in cosmology, the large scale structure. How does this work? Um, and my colleagues ask me what Mond does to cosmology. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. This is, this is a hard problem. Um, there are aspects of cosmology that I think I can understand better with Mond, that Mond will grow structure. It'll grow it faster, and so a prediction is that you should see more structure at higher redshift, big galaxies in place, sooner than you predict with dark matter. And there are already indications that that's true. But what I cannot do is what Einstein did, is write down an equation that tells you the evolution of the history of the universe, how it expands as a function of time. I just don't know how to do that in Mond. But the fact that we've had to invoke now dark matter as well as dark energy makes me think, well, hmm, do we really know how to do that in general relativity? Or are we just fudging it? So I think uh, we need to be a little more humble in approaching this and, and admitting that there's a lot that we don't know. We think we don't know. Now, uh, I continue to try to test this idea to see where it breaks, and I continue to be surprised at how well it works. So this is uh, a very recent work, just in the last couple of years, a survey called PANDAS uh, of the area around Andromeda. So this is M31, and the optical image you're used to seeing is where my laser pointer is. This goes out to much larger scales, all the way over to M33 here. And uh, the gray things in there represent individual stars, so density of, of red giants. And when you do this, you find that Andromeda has a few dozen of these circled uh, dwarf companions. Those are little, low surface brightness, uh, puffballs of galaxies orbiting around Andromeda. Uh, and so I realized that as the survey was going on that they were discovering these things and this was an opportunity to test it again because these are low surface density things, they're in the modified regime, and with MOND all you need to do is look at it and you can make a prediction. You measure how much light there is, and you can figure out what the velocity dispersion should be. Um, you can't do that in the dark matter picture, because you need to know how much dark matter that is, and you just don't know that. Uh, but with MOND, I, as they were finding them, I could predict what the velocity dispersions were. Uh, and so people started going out and measuring these things, and they were measuring them so fast that um, a lot of them were measured faster than I could write up the prediction. But I did manage to make some predictions a priori. So this is the velocity dispersion, that is how fast the stars are moving relative to each other, uh, both measured and predicted. So the circles are my predictions, the other points are uh, what's observed. And each box here is a different dwarf, so Andromeda 1, Andromeda 2, Andromeda 3, all the way up to Andromeda 33 here. Okay? And in fact, when I first published this paper, these guys weren't even known yet. Uh, but I keep, try, try to keep up with them. So now you can just go through and ask where does it work and where does it doesn't. Green is where it works, red is where it doesn't, and yellow is where it's eh, can't really tell. So this, this case is a real problem. The prediction is down here and there are several different independent data sets that are significantly higher. That's a real problem for the theory. These are the trees, right? That's a tree, these are the forests. All right. And uh, a priori predictions, where I actually managed to write down what the number would be before it was measured, here, 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 here. And these cases, too, these are really strong tests because um, the, in this uh, strange theory of Milgram's, uh, the equivalence principle appears to be broken. And so it doesn't just matter what the dwarf is doing, it matters if the dwarf is close to its host or far away. And so these were all far away, and so the prediction was more secure, and they're just bang on. But this difference between uh, whether the host is affecting the internal dynamics of the dwarf is another test, I realized, uh, because you can find pairs of dwarfs, so these uh, cases connected by lines, the dwarfs look the same. That is, they have the same amount of light to within the errors. So if they were completely isolated away from 
uh, any host, and they would have exactly the same predicted velocity dispersion. But since some of them are close to their host, the EFE regime, there's a different prediction even though they're the same dwarf. So you can go through and see if you see that effect. So this one's isolated, it's up here, this one's EFE, it should be lower. Yeah, can't really tell here. Here, okay, it should be faster, should be slower there. Well, that you can tell. You can do this statistically this way. So this is back to the tolly fisher relation. These are all the rotating galaxies I told you about before. The square points are now these dwarf uh, companions, now both of Andromeda and our own Milky Way. And if they're isolated, so that the host isn't really playing a role, they're red. If the uh, host is playing a role, then they're in light blue there. And you can work out in MOND what the right mapping is uh, for each of these regimes, and that's what you get. So you notice the red ones that are isolated, they just go smack onto the relation the way they should. The blue ones, it's a little more complicated. But you notice the blue ones, the scatter goes way down. So there is some virtue to this strange formula that Milgram has cooked up. But it's not perfect. If it was perfect, they would be right on this line. So I thought, aha, I finally got it. After 20 years, he's wrong. And then I looked at it, well, shoot, he's right up here. What's going on down here? These galaxies down at the bottom here, this, look at the scale. This is stellar masses of 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. These are not even a respectable globular cluster in mass. These are tiny, tiny, tiny systems. And so not only are they affected by the host, they're messed up. So this is a plot of the a measured ellipticity, what the shape of the thing is as a function of how many orbits a star makes inside the dwarf for every orbit the dwarf makes around the host. And when that number is around one, you know it's messed up because the star is orbiting the host as much as it is itself. And that really sets in a bit sooner because this measurement was made at the half-light radii, so a star further out is closer to this regime. And all these galaxies that fall off of the relation that don't make sense in MON are messed up. I mean, look at this thing. The assumption that you have to make to do the calculation in the first place is that they're in dynamical equilibrium. Does that look like it's in equilibrium? And in fact, if you use this criterion, it tells you when you wouldn't really expect them to be in equilibrium. And in fact, they're all messed up. The ones that fall off the relation should fall off the relation. Or at least you don't expect it to work because they're not in equilibrium and the fundamental assumption that you made in the first place doesn't hold. Then it gets much harder to predict what they are doing. So I don't want to say it's okay for the theory, but it's not obviously a killer for the theory either. So, you know, I do go and tell my colleagues about this and that I think there's a serious problem with cold dark matter, and then I end up feeling like this guy on the witness stand here. Uh, you know, I, the Earth's shaped like a burrito, too. Um, I can't help it. This is what the data say, and it would be a dishonest not to. Uh, and my experience has been that there's a lot of reality denial in the community. There's a lot of hope that these data will just change and magically this will all go away. Uh, and I keep pushing on it and it keeps staying put. So uh, this is where we're at. There is something fundamentally wrong with the universe. Maybe it's dark matter. Maybe we don't understand gravity. I thank you for your time.